We're looking at a storm, we think. At Although, some point. I don't know if you read your forecast this morning, but it literally says we've been eyeing a winter storm since Monday, but we're not getting paid, so we're not really sure if it's accurate. It's right there on the app. You can look at it. Okay, maybe it doesn't say that. But you know they're thinking it. You know that's exactly what they're thinking. Uh, this could be several inches, and it looks like it could start to get a little messy starting on Friday. So a little snow on Friday, and then uh, the bulk of it coming in later on in the day on Saturday into Sunday. So uh, Rachel Witter is uh, pretty happy right now. Well, and uh, Lewis County is under a winter adwe- winter weather advisory starting at 10 a.m. this morning. Yeah, that's kind of underway now. Uh, let's see what else do we have. The, the Nexus uh, Center, the money is in the uh, is in the budget. It's really only about half of it, though, right? I believe that in, accounts for half, so how many millions of dollars? Accounts for half of the money it would take to create that. But that was big. That was expected to be in the budget last year, and it never happened. So what is the difference this year? The only difficulty is that you don't have uh, Brindisi and you don't have uh, Griffo in the majority. To, to make sure that ends up getting passed, right? It is a budget proposal at this point by the governor. I was excitedly hoping to hear the governor talk about it yesterday. Unfortunately, he did not. Uh, he didn't mention it at all. Well, it's in the budget, at least, uh, which is a uh, which is a positive. He talked about pot and the legalization. I was surprised at the money that uh, they're being very, very conservative when it comes to the money generated, the money uh, earned. By uh, by marijuana being legalized in uh, in New York State, other states uh, like Colorado tout a lot more than what uh, what they what, have actually. What was his number? I, I forget what it was. Three hundred million, and he wanted yeah, three hundred million dollars, which is which is which is a conservative number when you think about it. Yeah, well, and especially when considering he's going to put a twenty percent tax on retail sales. So that means let's say you spend a hundred dollars and you spend a hundred dollars in a dispensary, you're going to spend one hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, and, and with that, even with that, uh, they're thinking only about $300 million. So, uh, let's see what else. Anthony Brindisi. Can I, can we just one more thought on that? Mm-hmm. Because this story came out, I was just pulling it up and I looked for it. Uh, this is about the state of Colorado because there was a story that came out that since 2015, they had generated X millions of dollars and it was significantly lower. Well, he probably- this is the Denver Post. It's going to oh. try to make me. Well, the the uh, and maybe subscribe. that's why they're uh, the the uh, Cuomo's numbers are, are projected as low as as they are three hundred million dollars when you're looking at the size of New York State's budget. Um, that is not a world. Everything up to this point has been the legalization of marijuana is just going to be world changing here for us. But uh, but I don't see three hundred million dollars changing the world for New York State. Is it possible he learned his lesson from the gaming, where he thought, you know, Could hey, be. this is going to yeah. make so much money, so now well, he wants to be careful to not shoot himself in the foot? And that was a bit of a of an oversaturation, right? They just completely oversaturated. Uh, interesting story out of um, a Nancy Pelosi world. So you know that uh, up to this point, everybody <laughs> has said that uh, that Brindisi not voting for her and campaigning against her was all, she was the mastermind. And uh, she would not do any bit of uh, retaliation that she was um, probably the person who was behind it all. So Brindisi was given a pass to um, to be able to not vote for her. Well, I don't know. He's in the news today uh, that he has been bypassed um, by a couple of committee positions, and so has the entire New York delegation been bypassed and it was blocked by the California de- delegation. It's believed it is retaliation uh, to the New York Democrat and other Democrats in New York for not supporting Nancy Pelosi. Does that surprise you? Uh, no, actually, it really doesn't. And I didn't think all along that he was given some kind of a pass where it was, we know you really support us secretly. But well, I, I remember that from Claudia Tenney's campaign oh, yeah. concession, if, no, you, right. if you recall. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's all over the news today. The Democrats who opposed Pelosi have just been snubbed. And keep in mind, uh, Brindisi is somebody who's in a Republican-leaning district. Mm-hmm. Um, he is somebody who's in a district that Trump had won. Uh, here's Fox News, another anti-Pelosi Democrat. Representative Anthony Brindisi from upstate New York was also blocked from getting an Armed Services Committee position 
on Monday, further suggesting that the House leadership is retaliating against those who opposed Nancy Pelosi. Pretty wild. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk with Anthony Brindisi later on this morning. There's a lot to talk about, including the shutdown. Also this morning, Anthony, uh, John Salka, who is the new assemblyman who took over for Bill McGee. Bill McGee. Longtime Democrat Bill McGee. After three and, tries. Uh, and he is uh, right. I mean, he, he was very committed to that position. Yeah. Uh, he's on a little later on as well. Um, let's see. There are a couple of announcements. Did you see Gillibrand, who I, I don't think has any chance in the world, uh, but she made her very big announcement last night. Uh, Tanya J. Powers. No, she's she's going to all six years, years she's yeah. going to stay. Tanya J. Powers standing by right now from Fox News. Good morning, Tanya, that uh, she joined a couple of others, right? Already got uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, who has formed an exploratory committee. Uh, Julian Castro, uh, who is, by the way, in New Hampshire today. Uh, I think he was there to yesterday, part of yesterday, and then today uh, doing some stuff. Uh, you know, getting out and greeting people. Um, Kirsten Gillibrand is the latest one that says she's going to. She's launching an exploratory committee for 2020. Uh, she says it's an important first step, and it's one I'm taking because I'm going to run. She made that announcement on yeah. uh, the late show with Co- Stephen Colbert. Uh, she, she's, uh, I mean, we're reporting today that she's, um, she is considering, she's forming an exploratory commi- committee, but she announced last night that she is running. She's, uh, I don't know why she needs to explore once she's already made up her mind. Um, but I gotta I'm, tell I'm you- assuming she's, I'm assuming all these people are trying to feel out whether the, they're going to have the, you know, the donations that they're going to need because I mean, right. you're going to have this really crowded as it as it is expected to be, yeah. um, you know, field of candidates. Like, I mean, I guess much resembling the 2016 Republican field, uh, but you're going to have that for 2020 with the Democrats. Uh, they're going to have to they're going to have to all make sure they can fund it. Yeah, there'll be more than uh, certainly more than a dozen candidates that are probably going to be vying for the uh, nomination. Tanya, she just announced. I mean, it was three months ago. I'm yeah. committing to yeah. six years. I won't run for president. Well, well then she's just, projecting that she's going to lose. because she knows she's not going to win. <laughs> uh, Tanya, I wonder, I have to tell you that um, we, of course, in New York State, are a state that had Senator Hillary Clinton. And while I will tell you that upstate uh, here, she is not popular, Hillary Clinton. Um, and this will anger some people, but all they have to do is look at themselves honestly. Um, Hillary Clinton knew she was going to be running for president. And she was present up here. You saw Hillary Clinton. She was involved in legislation. She visited here. She worked with local leaders here. She was a very, um, I know people will debate the word effective, but in terms of visibility and trying to accomplish things in New York, she was extremely effective. This woman doesn't even know our names. We don't. We don't see Kirsten Gillibrand. The one time she re- she was, I covered an event she was at. She didn't look up from her notes once. Yeah, I, I wow. find it. Uh, and but I think downstate it's it's different, right? In the New York City area, she's uh, she spends a, a a good amount of time there. But upstate, we just don't see her. I think that's interesting. I'm also interested in what you were saying about uh, when Hillary was a senator, because that when when she ran and I covered uh, the stuff in, in 2020. Yeah. Um, and this was back before she was the, the nominee or anything. This was when she was still, you know, going head to head with Bernie. Uh, and I covered uh, some of her events. One of the ones that um, it was actually held at the Apollo. It was one of her um, campaign events. Yeah. And I was talking to people uh, outside it after it was over, and these are you know people from New York, and they were saying they were pointing to her work as senator as the reason why they were going to vote for her, which I think is is, is interesting. That not only was she uh, did she was she very visible here, but upstate as well. And I don't hear that kind of stuff about Gillibrand here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's probably only because we haven't been out asking people about it because she hadn't been sure. you know she hadn't said she was going to an exploratory committee until now. And let's be fair. I think that uh, Hillary Clinton knew she was going to be running for president and wanted and knew that by yeah. being present, by by being involved, by meeting local leaders, by uh, that would all assist her in her quest to ultimately become president of the United States. However, at the very least, um, uh, we were getting the grease as the squeaky wheel up here, and that's something we haven't seen with her. And then the one time of, of recent note that Gillibrand was in town, do you remember I kind of pointed out she was at the Stanley announcing she was trying to get the Democrats and Republicans to agree to put a pool of money together 
that would be for historic places like the Stanley. But the money wouldn't go to the Stanley. It was actually to pay for state officials to advocate on behalf of the Stanley. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. like it, it was the most weirdest thing. Oh, and it, and wow. then, then we asked, so is the Stanley getting money? She's like, no, no, but but. Places like the Stanley could get the money. She came all the way to you to, yeah, to say to, that. To, I was like, you came here for this? To, to look as if things were, uh, well, it's, it's going to be interesting. But, uh, Tanya, you're right. There are going to be a lot of people throwing their uh, their hat into the into the ring here. There are. Uh, matter yeah. of fact, the uh, my, my I'm kind of trying to, as a de facto sort of homework assignment, is keep up with all of that and really start getting in-depth with you know the field and who is who is who and yeah, their backgrounds yeah. and everything, and it's it's getting hard. I, real quick, I want to ask you about what your feelings are on the new stuff from the state legislature about the early vote, legislature about the early voting, and the absentee balloting and, and stuff like that. What do you guys think about those those moves? Uh, I have to tell, it, it's interesting watching the governor's uh, state of the I don't know. It's not state called of the, the state, state of the budget state, proposal. But, but uh, watching <laughs> that yesterday, um, he was not holding anything back saying, listen, we have a unique opportunity here. Uh, We have the Senate majority as Democrats. We have the Assembly majority, and you have a governor who is a Democrat. In the first 100 days, we're going to accomplish more than any other legislature has ever accomplished, which tells you all these things he's proposing, he thinks he can get it done. And and you ask about the, uh, the early voting and that sort of thing. Moving the primary to June is sending everybody into a tizzy here because they all have to go out and get signatures. They thought they had time, the Mm -hmm. the primary in September, but it's going to be in June. Yeah, I, I think that was that was one of the shocks when I moved here, um, because I was like, wait, we can't early vote. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, why not? And, and I, I it's, <laughs> because it's it's you know it's taken for granted in so many states. I lived in two that have either had early voting or absentee ballots or you know some combination of that. Yeah, and yeah. I, I've always said it was very odd that, that New York didn't have that. But I just kind of wondered what your listeners were saying about that stuff. Well, listen, you could always vote with an absentee ballot, but it was more difficult. They're going to make it a lot easier, yeah. and to vote early. Um, it's, it's something just strange that, to me. It is. it is strange for us. For because, us, yeah. it's strange to be able to do that. Time yeah, yeah. Man, you always look forward to that one big day where everybody gets out, and get votes, your little so. sticker. I voted. Yeah, I voted. I voted <laughs> early. They're going to have to make new stickers. All right, Tanya, thank you as always. You have a wonderful Anytime, day. Anytime, y'all. Right. Tanya G. Thank Powers you. from Fox News. Frank on the uh, state of the state that really wasn't a state of the state. It was what state of the budget, Frank? It was you? both yeah. Democratic yeah. pep rally. Yeah, in Utica, <laughs> Frank. Good morning. Well, good morning and happy new year to everybody over there. Happy new year to you. Yeah. Um, I saw the Senti's remarks after the state of the budget, and if I were a minority, I would be very, very upset at his stance ultimately on uh, marijuana. So apparently he doesn't like money, and my view is that he's probably going to opt out. We're going to be one of those counties that opt out between him and Mayshow already made ridiculous statements that are antiquated. Uh, they're just part of the usual rhetoric. Yeah. And they're just sitting in a pool of ignorance. And that's what bothers me about people that enforce laws. Um, if you're going to be against something, be against something for the right reason. Don't be I, against something because it's the, something that right. you've always been told. You know what I mean? I, I got to tell you, I, I do wonder when you look at the uh, – you look at Upstate – and now the governor is saying that uh, that counties can opt out of the uh, out, out of this. Um, I would think your best shot to not opt out would be Oneida County, and everybody in Oneida County is coming out uh, coming out against it. But you have right. conservative counties in Madison, in uh, in Herkimer. Um, right. You kind of if you kind of think. If if they were to get if they get and they will get the chance to opt out, you do kind of feel like they might just do that, right? And and, and that's the sad situation because you know we're talking about tens of millions of dollars in uh, revenue being generated by a substance that is far less uh, harmful than alcohol than opioids. Uh, I you know again I still can't believe that the Senate made that tie in between legalization of marijuana and an opioid crisis. Yeah. This guy, he needs, and it's scary, and, and I'm not even sensationalizing because this guy is literally completely disconnected from this huge, gigantic movement that's sweeping the nation, ultimately wrought in racism. Yeah. So the governor wants to, you know, advance this, well, uh, and, 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 repeal prohibition, and ultimately yep. to try and uh, uh, reestablish uh, the people that were 
hurt ultimately minorities, people of color, so on and so forth, by the prohibition itself that, again, is raw in racism. And these people are just still sitting there, again, continuing the rhetoric and ultimately promoting the racism that's existed for, you know, I'm 60, sorry. 70 years. I, I, I know uh, Manaski's disagreeing on the racism part, but he's absolutely right. right. Uh, but Frank, but Frank is... Do some reading, Manaski. Frank Read. is... Frank is, uh, let me just finish. Go ahead. Frank is correct that the majority of the people that have been affected by m- marijuana laws are black, black sure. guys. The majority. But but saying you yeah. don't think a, this community is, saying you don't think that it's a good thing for this community doesn't mean that you're promoting racism because you don't think that a drug that has been illegal for a long time should be legalized, I don't think. Well, I think he's saying that the, that they're uninformed. By not legalizing, you're continuing. You're continuing yeah. this, uh, uh, this kind of racist agenda. Again, again, it's a racist agenda. I don't agree with that. I, I do that. It majority, majority. majority excuse me. I agree that it majority negatively affects. Go ahead. You go okay, on, go fair on. enough. I, I do have to go. Frank, listen. I want to talk more about this. So call in again on this because it's going to be a topic that we're going to be talking about uh, a lot in the next six months. So. Uh, Okay, and, thanks, and Manassi, thanks. Appreciate Frank that, says man. read. He's a teacher. He's okay. telling you to read. All right, uh, Rachel standing. What? Read what? Rachel standing by right now. Rachel Sutherland from Fox News. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> uh, the Senate confirmation hearings underway. Uh, Rachel, what do we know here today? I want to get a little update on this because this one looks like it's going to actually happen without any real craziness. Right. There weren't even any, any protesters to be heard yesterday yeah. at this confirmation hearing for, for Bill Barr, for Attorney General. Now, he's been an Attorney General before under the, the first uh, Bush administration, and so uh, this was fairly uh, smooth sailing for him. There were a lot of questions about the Russia probe, but he promised to be an independent AG to uh, to not do anything to disturb the Russia probe. He wants it to come to its natural conclusion. He said he tried to make as much of that uh, the report as public as possible. Um, and it, so there were a lot of questions from Democrats and Republicans about that and about a memo he wrote last summer where he talked about what he called Bob Mueller's theory of obstruction of justice. Uh, but really, I think when it comes down to it, he'll be confirmed. Republicans have the votes for it. Democrats really aren't making a stink about it. And um, and he doesn't seem to want to recuse himself from the Russia probe either. Uh, and as for once that probe is done and once the investigation is complete and the report comes out, he did hint a little yesterday at um, first he wants to make as much of it possible as uh, much of it public as possible, but not everything necessarily based on on the laws and the regulations. That's exactly right, and that did start to spark some questions uh, among the media uh, about what exactly does that mean? Uh, who's the one who comes up with the rules? Um, uh, he it, it's really Barr who has the final say on what becomes public, and so. If there's no kind of charges or prosecution, some findings may not be made public. And so that has some people concerned. But that would be subject to, I think, FOIA requests and lawsuits. So, um, yeah. So I think, by and large, uh, a pretty successful day for Bill Barr. Today is day two. He won't be there. It'll be a panel of witnesses talking about him. That's pretty customary. And you would expect this to be confirmed, him to be confirmed. Uh, I mean, predictions are already being made that it's going to go through pretty easily. I think so. Yeah, in the, even uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, the Democrat there, was saying that, that she thinks so, but she said, Look, yeah, we'll yeah. see. Uh, okay, very interesting. Rachel Sutherland, Fox News, thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, coming up, I want to talk to Rachel Witter uh, from Eyewitness News, the chief meteorologist over there. We'll give an update on what's going to happen over the next couple of days. By Sunday night, we could, and it seems uh, to be uh, the percentages are moving in favor that this will happen, we could have uh, quite a lot of snow on the ground. I don't know if you looked out there right now, but at least in the valleys, we're looking at about a dusting, maybe some places with two or three inches, but that's about it. Uh, are you reading? Yeah. Frank wants you to read. How and do you we'll, spell marijuana? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, on the other side. It's worth getting back into. Google. Uh, sure. 637. The other thing about marijuana leading to opioid abuse, I do think that marijuana is considered... Um, a uh, a de- uh, not necessarily a deterrent, but people who are suffering from opioid addiction seem to find relief with with marijuana. 
not the fact that marijuana leads to opioid. Opioid abuse has Stem happened. from prescription drugs. Has happened for a lot of reasons, but yeah. I don't think pot has been the uh, has been the cause of opioid abuse. So uh, when he says that some people are a little ill-advised on that, I think that he does have a point. Uh, 638, we'll get into all of it coming up. Update on the news and weather next to WYVX. I, I want to get Rachel, Rachel uh, Witter coming up uh, and get her update on the forecast as to what we can expect with this uh, heavy snow that could be possible. Uh, Friday, I want to take her first. Is she, uh, is she ready? Let's do it. Uh, good morning, Rachel Witter, Fox Eyewitness News, uh, all of that. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got <laughs> snow on my mind, Rachel. What are we looking at here? Is this thing going to hit us? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, and, and I, I saw you last night. You're You're talking about maybe significant snow on Friday, not just Saturday and Sunday. Well, I didn't say, I wouldn't say significant. Okay. Bill, right. don't put words in my mouth. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm just but, saying I must have been dreaming. Uh, either yeah, way, um, what are we talking about on Friday? Yeah, so we have we have two storm systems, one of them has been Thursday night, Friday, and that's going to give us some accumulation, maybe um, three to five inches at the most with that. There's not a ton of moisture, but just the way that it's headed towards us, it puts us kind of right in the, the heaviest stuff that we could get from that. So that's going to be round one. That's going to wrap up by about noon Friday. And then um, the bigger storm is going to move in Saturday night, Sunday, and that one has a lot a lot more moisture to work with. Yeah, and yeah. Um, since the storm Friday is going to cool us down enough, um, it's going to be all snow. I, that's, there's no question there. So most of the storms we've had this year, um, we've either been like in the transition zone where it's rained to snow and that cuts down snow totals or um, just puts, it, puts us in all rain. So this time we're actually on the cold side of things. So mm. um, that will give us, this is going to be a, a longer duration storm. So it starts overnight and they'll probably last all day Sunday. It's hard to put numbers on that one too, um, even though, you know, things are becoming a little bit more clear with it. Um, I I couldn't give you a number out of that one quite yet, but yeah. um, I would I would plan on um, this would be probably our first you know real big snowstorm of the year. Uh, and you know, students um, uh, all saying, "Well, why does it have to fall on the weekend? Couldn't it come during the middle of the week?" They've had enough snow. I, I think they have already, considering we've had a pretty weak winter and there's already been a few snow days. Uh, right. Okay, no school Monday. It's just you know no hope. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, as the at the very least, as we get closer to the weekend, the percentages look greater that this storm is yeah. going to hit us and impact us in some way. Yeah, for okay. sure. Fair enough. All right, Rachel. Thank you for that significant forecast. I appreciate <laughs> thank you. It. Okay. She's just sick of going to Tug Hill to have to snowmobile. I mean, well, a, uh, this could be a uh, a real real deal here. So they say. We'll see what happens. Uh, Frank is back on in Utica here. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. Hey, good morning. First off, let, let me extend my apologies to Jeff Manaski. Uh, you know, I didn't mean to come off as being harsh or anything like that. But by the it, way, hold on, hold on, Frank. My yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael is saying perhaps uh, Bill, your wife, could do a remedial reading program for Jeff down the road here. So. <laughs> yes, can, can we get me into a program? <laughs> uh, yeah. As we continue again, it's not my job to convince anybody of anything. Yes, knowledge is power. And, you know, with this movement that's happening, you know, as I'm listening and as I'm finding out more and more information, it's become very clear to me that everything, everything that I've learned about cannabis from school to public perception, so on and so forth, ultimately has been disproven at every turn. Just read. Just yeah. read. It's all out there. The reasons why it was prohibited in the first place was because alcohol the prohibition ended there, and the person that was in charge of uh, prohibiting alcohol needed to maintain his job, and they went after the Mexicans, and then they went after the blacks. And those people were targeted unfairly for a substance that really, again, is way less harmful than alcohol, and I wanna, way less and, harmful and, than cigarettes. And, and I want to bring in just one thing. You're not necessarily saying that Rob Machel or Anthony Pacenti are racist. You're saying no. that— no, no, that no. Explain, no. because that's where I think Manaski's kind of taken issue. Okay, okay. No, it, it, not racist uh, outwardly, but by maintaining your ignorance and by not necessarily uh, informing yourself, 
and continuing the prohibition, you are, by default, promoting the racist agenda that ultimately spurred the prohibition of marijuana. That's ultimately why. And again, the minorities are the ones that are most adversely affected by the prohibition Frank, of if, cannabis. If I can say, just going back to what sure. Sheriff Maciel has said on our program, his concerns yeah. are based on law enforcement statistics, uh, traffic yeah. fatality increases in yeah. the states where it's already legalized. So yeah. I think he's done, I think, some of yeah, his research I, as a I, law enforcement say person. That, those numbers are, are not crazy skewed. numbers. Yeah. They are skewed. Yeah. And they you look skewed. at, when you, when you really, my son is in Denver. So, and I'm not a big pot guy necessarily. My right, son is in, is in Denver, and it has been a huge boon for the uh, for for Colorado. And while in any case, whenever the, the things do, uh, like for instance, they can't put their money in the bank; they have to put their money in in safes because if they put it in a bank, the fed the feds will take the money. Uh, right. So you could also then say that robbery is up. Um, and it probably is because of that uh, because of that policy, but to the point where it should remain illegal and where people should remain in jail um, for I mean I, I I'll tell you twenty years ago in family court it was brought up uh, marijuana was brought up in family court twenty years ago in Herkimer County and the judge said listen I I, I think we all pretty much look differently on on marijuana don't even bring it up. That was 20 years ago. Oh, wow. So, uh, so you can imagine h- how things kind of have, have gone on through the, uh, through the years. Um, I-, I, just, I-, I just find that I, I also don't know that this is going to turn into this huge, uh, all these, the numbers they're talking about are $300 million in revenues, uh, in tax revenue. That's not as big as we all, as we all thought. That's certainly not going to change the economy of New York State. But if the, if they do it correctly, long term, it absolutely yeah. could. All right, fair enough. You know? Yeah, and and again, we have to bring up the black market versus the white market, right? Anything with regulation becomes safer. Uh, people are going to smoke cannabis regardless, and if they're going to the black market, there's a whole safety issue. It's unregulated. You don't know what you're getting, where it's from. Uh, you know, the, the the regulation of marijuana is a benefit throughout. And New York State already did all the research, and they produced a paper with 90 points of why it is that uh, repealing the prohibition is a benefit. It does more good yeah. than it does bad. And, you know, the research is out there. It's just a matter of sitting down and just looking through it and, and getting that aha moment. And, it's and you know, again, not, not to continue uh, using the word scary, but, you know, my whole entire life I was lied to about something that was pretty uh, pretty substantial. You know what Frank, I mean? It was you... an entire belief system, an entire paradigm that was ultimately uh, uh, a lie, as far as I'm concerned, Frank, and, that, and that's troublesome. Frank, I've so, I've read pre- yeah. pl- plenty of content on marijuana use, uh, health impacts, legalization. Yeah. I have I have read so- some things on what's going right. on in the state of Colorado. If there's something you think I should look at that really changed your mind, please forward uh, it to us. But but yeah. let me say this: I I also think that. Um, I don't. I I, th- I I think there's a lot of hypocrisies in the argument, and I, certainly uh, it has negatively impacted the minority community as far as uh, sure. being arrested and uh, jail sentences for 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 marijuana. That's certainly ridiculous. But you know, like the state health department comes out without assessing the health impact and gives the number one reason that it should be legalized is the tax revenue. And I don't know that that's really the position the health department should take. Uh, Frank, I appreciate the call. Thanks, man. Please, uh, please send me something if you'd like me to read and, it. Uh, I will, Jeff. I will this morning. Thanks. Okay. Anne in uh, Rome has been it. waiting for a bit here. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Anne, good morning. You're on the radio. And the issue uh, that the governor, of course, talked about yesterday, one of the biggies was the legalization of pot. And by the way, you could see it in New York State before April. Um, I think this is going to move very quickly. Actually, I'm against it. And I'll okay. tell you a good reason why. I watched the show locked up abroad a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, they have these little pop-ups with information. It says, in 2006, when the United States, some states started legalizing marijuana, Mexico started increasing their sales of methamphetamine and heroin coming over to the United States. I'm not saying that people don't sell it here and they don't make it here. But that is a fact. 
And as a three-time cancer survivor, I think it's great if you can use it for real medical purposes, not, oh, doctor, I don't feel good. I need medical marijuana. Don't you think, though, that, Ann, that they're they're all, I mean, you have police officers today looking the other way on, on pot. You have courts looking the other way on pot. It's it, it and many studies will show that it is less uh, less harmful to people than than actually alcohol, and part because it's not addictive. Um, I don't know the correlation between marijuana and opioid abuse. If there's an increase in 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 opioids coming into the United States, it has nothing to do with pot. It has to do with the fact that rising there addiction. is a there is an addiction here, and people yeah. are are doing whatever they can stealing. And breaking into your house in order to be able to get a hold of it. Exactly, and that's that's the that's a comment that. But that doesn't when, have anything to do with marijuana. I find myself on the argument of on the side of promo, of, of defending it's marijuana. It's a money maker, and I and I don't necessarily want to be there. But I I also feel that we do a and part of what Frank talks about is there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I don't I think you hurt your cause, not yours in particular, Ann, but. The, the government hurts its own cause when it puts out things that are not true. Well, apparently, if they put that on locked up abroad, and it, it's a yeah. show about drugs being smuggled. So, it, so it's place. saying that they, because of the legalization of marijuana, more meth is being pushed into the United States? Meth and heroin. Yeah, I don't coming believe. Coming across I, the border. And, I, and the purpose yeah. is because if I'm not making money selling marijuana, then I'm going to push something else. I see make what you're money. saying. Okay. That's the problem. But the problem with marijuana is, now, if they legalize it, what's going to happen if I turn around and I have five pounds sitting on my car seat and I get stopped for speeding? Is the police officer going to say, did you buy that on the street? No, I bought it at the store. So it's not going to change anything. It'll make it easier for drug dealers to sell marijuana, and they could sell it to anybody now because you can't arrest me because it's legal. Well, I mean, they know exactly which cigarettes are not authentic. I'm sure the state will know what uh, marijuana is not certified. Yeah, it, so, and I will but say- again, that's not a good a, a reason for. I mean, I could have a jug of moonshine sitting on my car in, in yeah. the seat of my car. You still can't drive and smoke pot. Um, but but they, you, I, you would there, see them. My and- question: Is there something? Because I, I trust me, I know a lot of people that have done it over the years. Yeah, I would never get in a car with them. No, I, I don't think you should. But I, I'll tell there's you, there's no way to find all... out if you are under the influence of marijuana when you're driving. Well, when the cloud of smoke comes out of the car, I, I li- well, I there are to... officers. You know, we've heard from law enforcement yeah. that there are people specially trained to detect that. But also in, on the five pounds thing, I think in other states there's a limit to like one ounce a day. So if you've got five pounds yeah, of car, one ounce a day is car, a lot, though, right? That is, oh but God. it's a yeah. lot less than five. All pounds. right, and I'm, I'm going to move on. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very Thanks. much. And and my experience was was over the summer. We talked about this where I'm at the gas station and a car drives up and the kids clearly sitting there smoking pot. And how do you know? Well, it, it reeks. Yeah, you can see it coming out of the car. For God's sakes. And 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 that person should be in the same way. If somebody was drunk, that person should be should be pulled over and arrested for driving under the influence. Uh, Kathy in Rome, you're on the radio. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I was just wondering. Uh, they have the marijuana magazines. Can you order marijuana seed and have it come through the U.S. mail without getting arrested? I mean, I know you can't. You can't grow it on your property, but I don't think so because uh, the the I. I for one reason I would throw out there is that the Postal Service is federal and marijuana is still illegal. Yeah, in fact, there was a case here where a guy government. got busted for trying yeah, to ship marijuana. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, but let me tell you something. In Michigan State, Kathy? Yes. Uh, is marijuana legal there? They're green still... for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> They're green for a reason. All right, Kathy. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Wayne in, uh, in Utica. And Wayne has told stories on the air about pot laced with rat poison and um, you just don't know what you're buying and that was one of the things the governor talked about yesterday is that by regulating it um, it will be regulated to make sure that what is being sold is actually authentic and not tainted with who knows what Wayne and Utica you're on the radio 
that's why I think it'll be safer for people if they're going to be getting, I mean, I, I'm not for it because I think it makes you lazy. I know firsthand that it takes away from your uh, attention. I don't care what anybody says. You can get hooked on it because I got up and had to smoke it all day long. I tried to quit it way back when, I mean, I, don't smoke it anymore. It's been a long time, but I had a hell of a time trying to quit it just like you do cigarettes and people are like, oh, it's not addicting. It, sh- it certainly is yeah. addicting. It was to me. And it's I, think, yeah, I, I actually his own. do think it's more addicting. It, than is, it, it is. So just it's clinically not addictive. Yeah, However, that's they, that's just say. like you can be uh, you people, some people are addictive to Binge listen, watching? Sweet. Listen, <laughs> I've been addicted to, right, binge watching or whatever. Uh, yeah. Doritos, are not, Doritos are not addictive, but it's boy, I got to I gotta have them. And there have been a few times in my life that I think I've been addicted to um, to a uh, to a female. So, um, and, and that really <laughs> I hear you. creates, a, That's creates very dangerous. a horrible uh, outcome, uh, just <laughs> for the but, record. But I wins. think, I, th- I honestly think that if, if they're going to do, uh, you know, going to regulate it and, and know what's in it, you're safer to do it with them knowing it than yeah, to go and yeah. buying right. some weak pot on the streets that they boosted up with some something to alter it. Uh, fair enough. Thanks, Wayne. We appreciate Thanks, it. Later, guys. All right. And I'll do one more on this topic. It obviously is hitting home to, for a lot of people. Uh, surprisingly, uh, Manaski. By the way, uh, Frank, uh, Michael says, stop calling it the black and white market. That's what, that, that is, in itself and, is racist. You know, that's what, go ahead. Um, uh, John in Bridgewater. Hi, John. Hey, Bill. I know a friend of mine that I grew up with. She orders seeds off the internet mm. out of California. Yeah. And they ship them to her. They don't say, hey, this is from the marijuana factory out of California. Mm-hmm. These are high-end <laughs> seeds, and I've seen these plants, and they grow fast. And So I wonder if the, uh, right. so, through the internet, so do you think it's UPS Postal. So you think it's legal to send seeds, but not legal to send marijuana? Marijuana. Marijuana. Well, any, <laughs> anybody can uh, break that package open and smoke it, but the seeds, yeah. I, I don't know. That seeds are seem to be legal because... And John, what do you what do you think of the whole thing? Do you think it should be uh, legalized? Heck yeah! Yeah, okay. <laughs> Bill, I got a rotator cuff injury, and, and if I could get some uh, medical marijuana yeah, yeah. for my po- my pain, I yeah, definitely. You would man. do that. Yep. Yeah. And so. and that's why I'm saying that <laughs> yeah, that pope you, really helps. Uh, any of the the science that I've read on this is that marijuana actually alleviates um, uh, opioid abuse. Not necessarily, uh, but the woman in uh, the woman that called from Rome brings up an interesting point. So they can't, you know, with the legalization, their market is down for marijuana, so they're pushing something else. Right. Um, well, I, I guess I, that does make sense. When well, it can't be that, any so. worse than somebody getting behind the wheel hammered. No doubt about it. Yep. You know. All right, so, John. All right, Bill. Thanks, man. Hey. Yep. Bye. Uh, I didn't pe- expect everybody to jump on this, but we'll talk some more about it coming up next hour. Hold on tight. Assemblyman John Salka will get his take. Also, Anthony Brindisi coming up at WIBX. And she had a, uh, a Pringles can. It was filled with, I'm sure, cheap wine. It couldn't have been like a fine wine. So, uh, here's and my I wonder question. if that had a little saltiness to it, the Pringles can. Probably had, would. She poured the wine in the Pringles can and was drinking out of the Pringles can like it was a cup. That is correct. Or she was concealing... A thin wine bottle inside no, a Pringles no, can. Because no, 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 that's no. what I originally thought. No, she was no drinking wine. out of the Pringles can. Eat those chips. Okay. And driving and drinking, too, because those rascals can go a good three miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you come Did around the corner. A, a Dewey for that? I don't think so. You can get it for, like, if you're if you were tank. A garden tractor or something. Right? Sure. But oh, I don't yeah. think they can give you a DWI for going down aisle number seven at Walmart. Well, they said they caught her, didn't they? <laughs> Were you joking when you said that, that they got her in the parking lot? She was driving around in circles in the parking lot. That was when they caught up to her. No, no, I didn't. <clears throat> okay, maybe that was that was the punchline. That was the pot story. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Uh, 715, uh, standing by right now, is Assemblyman John Selka. Uh, John is to the south of us uh, in uh, Madison County and parts of Otsego. And Oneida County as well. Um, he was, uh, this is his third run was his third for end. the assembly. And this time he was successful. Assemblyman John Selka, good morning. Uh, good morning. And, and I got to uh, admit that uh, that's pretty good. That's a testament to how well Pringles containers are made because you would think after a while it would start leaking. That's a very good point. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking that myself that, you know, I mean, uh, 
you would think that the the wine would come right out of that. Yeah, you got to keep that fresh. You would think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they used to drink it fast. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Jeff has an update. Hold so, on. Uh, just because you, you mentioned it and I asked the question, this is according to, uh, I don't know, something in Wichita, Texas woman, Wichita Falls, Times New Record highlights. The woman had been riding around in the parking lot for hours. The wine woman with the Pringles? Starting yeah. at about 6.30 a.m. Friday, the electric shopping cart she was riding in usually used for people with physical limitations. Police found her in a nearby restaurant and told her that she had been banned from Walmart at the request of store employees. She was not arrested. Mm. More, more importantly, she was drinking out of wine out of a Pringles can. Does that uh, salty leftover? Okay, that's, just, yeah. that's another okay. punchline. Uh, well, I got to tell you, uh, I think John brings up a very, very solid point here that that is a well-made can of Pringles. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, okay, so how about a well-made speech? Uh, what do you think of the governor's uh, proposal yesterday? A lot of cotton candy in that uh, speech. Yeah, I guess that's a good way of putting it. You know, um, I'm encouraged by the uh, proposal that the governor wants to make the 2% property tax cap permanent, which has been talked about for a number of years. Now that's encouraging. Uh, a lot of a lot of fanfare about money being spent all throughout the state. I just have very serious concerns about how much money is going to be spent in upstate New York. And, you know, for years and years now, the governor has been talking about extra money for infrastructure. Yeah. And when I drive around my district, which is a pretty big district, it's mm-hmm. over 90 miles long, you know, the roads are, are, are worse, the bridges are worse, and all the money that's been spent over the past, or he claims has been spent, uh, I, I don't I don't see a lot of results from it at this point. Yeah, uh, you were the town supervisor uh, for quite some time in uh, in Brookfield, um, and uh, it's I want to talk about the tax cap. Uh, a lot of times, you'll talk to people from municipalities and school districts who really believe the tax cap is a a difficult burden to have to accomplish every year. What's your experience been? Um, because it does kind of handcuff municipalities. Well, it, it can. Uh, but I'll tell you, in my case, in the town of Brookfield, we never had to waive the property tax cap. We always stayed within the property tax cap. Uh, and, again, you know, running a town is a little bit different yeah. than running a larger operation. But on the county level, I never voted for a county budget that exceeded the property tax cap also. And, you know, Madison County's done a great job of staying within the property tax cap, not every year, but when they did have to exceed it, it wasn't by much. And, of course, you know, what forces people to exceed these kind of things are the state mandates. Madison County's budget is 100% mandated from the state. We live off our sales tax. But, you know, while I was supervisor in Brookfield, while maintaining the budget under the tax cap, we had new equipment, bigger fund balance than has ever been seen in town history. I dropped the property tax uh, rate in the town of Brookfield by 20% over 11 years. So it can be done. Uh, you know, government's got to kind of uh, tighten their belt and say, let's do things uh, as any business would do and, and, and look at it from a practical standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Squeeze every penny you can. Uh, what do you think of uh, the governor's uh, proposal here? And it looks like he's going to try to move pretty quickly on, uh, on the legalization of recreational marijuana. Well, you know, uh, I know it's looking uh, like a big cash cow, and I'm I'm kind of surprised the governor last year said it was a gateway drug and he would never uh, approve of its legalization. And now when they uh, suspect or, or they can uh, see that it's going to be a pretty good chunk of revenue, and you know now, now his attitude's changed and said it's going to be the best thing since sliced toast. You know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and the people that I, you know, knew of that got into drugs usually didn't start off doing hard drugs, okay? They usually started, you know, smoking marijuana and kind of leading into things. Of course, everybody's different. People have different addictive personalities, but uh, I I don't see uh, the pros outweighing the cons when it comes to legalization of of pot in New York State. The other states that are doing it are having their problems. They uh, they really did a pretty intense study on uh, with people on both sides of of the issue, and it came back pretty strongly uh, from the state that, the negatives uh, did not outweigh the positives. Uh, so you disagree with their findings? Well, yeah, I, I do. And I've read what's going on in Colorado. They have a higher number of motor vehicle accidents. And here's the, here's the kind of the, the fallacy about, uh, about legalizing pot is they are going to tax it so heavily. And there's already a very effective underground network set up right now to sell pot illegally. I think a lot of people are just going to bypass the huge amount of taxes that they're going to have to pay on this. 
on this drug, and they're just going to continue buying it on the black market. I mean, the taxes are going to be outrageous. People are always looking to save no, money, and I think they're still going to end up with a fair amount, fair number of people that are going to be buying it illegally. And again, to have more impaired drivers on the road is definitely not anything we need right now. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the governor's, uh, he's talking about an increase in, in education funding, but not nearly what, uh, what those uh, out there in education say they need. And, and certainly there's a problem with the, with the formula. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, on the governor in education? Well, you know, education is kind of near and dear to me. Uh, before I became town supervisor, I was the uh, president of the, a member and a president of the Brookfield School Board, so I got an intimate knowledge on school budgets and what we need to, to do to teach our children properly. And, you know, I'll use this as an example. During the campaign, um, I uh, was at an event hosted by the United Madison uh, School Board Institute. It was a group of school board members and mm-hmm. administrators. And they were going over the, some of the issues and the problems that they're, they're dealing with. And I said, well, this is amazing because these are the same problems I heard when I was on the school board 11, 12, 13 years ago. Has anything gotten better? And they said, as a matter of fact, it's gotten worse. So consecutive budget after consecutive budget presented by the governor, obviously, at least according to this group, is just not, it's just not doing it. Um, you know, throwing more money at something isn't always the issue. But we've got to give our administrators and our teachers and our support staff the tools that they need. And at this point, again, it's like the bridges and like the infrastructure. I just don't see a lot of improvements after we put billions and billions of dollars uh, into these systems. So you think there should be there should be more money or there shouldn't be more money for schools? Well, I think there should be more money, all right, because it's getting more and more expensive to deliver these services to, uh, uh, to our students. I mean, you have... Uh, uh, salaries and administrative costs that are, are going up all the time. Yeah. You know, maintaining an infrastructure for a school is getting more and more expensive. So, uh, you know, God forbid we ever have to decide, you know, between one priority and another when it comes to uh, to, to educating our, our kids. You know, we just need to make sure that they are properly funded and we listen to the people that are in, in the trenches, if you will, yeah. and what they mm-hmm. need. And sometimes in Alpine, okay. that doesn't happen. Uh, I have two other quickies I want to throw at you. Uh, number one, the uh, the governor's proposal to raise the age to buy uh, uh, cigarettes and tobacco products to 21. What do you think? Well, you know, my profession for 30 years is a registered respiratory therapist. So uh, cigarettes are no friend of mine. I used to be, uh, uh, I'm actually a certified tobacco cessation counselor. And, uh, you know, uh, cigarettes, the farther you put cigarettes out of the reach of, of young people, the better, as far as I'm concerned. And the the other issue, uh, the governor pushing, which looks like this will will work, will go through, especially with uh, Democratic control of the Senate and the Assembly, is to guarantee a woman's right to uh, abortion in New York State. Where are you on that? Well, you know, I had an opportunity, actually, a privilege to work in a neonatal intensive care unit down in Washington D.C. and over the years of my career. And in 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 the in the uh, in the practice, I held many 24 and 25 and 26 week old babies. Of course, that were born premature, but um, you know we went out and picked them up, and uh, you know in the different hospitals because we were a big hospital, big city hospital. And uh, you know I have a lot of strong uh, Christian beliefs, and um, I believe that this is definitely going in the wrong direction. Okay, so you feel that. Um... I'm pro-life. I'm a You're, staunch pro-life. Got it. All right. Uh, and, of course, somebody that is in the medical field um, uh, your your entire career. So, uh, John, anything else you want to add on the governor's proposal yesterday? Uh, no. Uh, I got to admit it was exciting being there. I sat right in back of uh, Mayor de Blasio from New York City. I didn't see him. Uh, I didn't see him clapping a lot. So, uh, you know, that's sure always whether, good right there. Whether that's sure he had a sore hand or something or, or what, but, uh, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm always going to be available for you, uh, for you guys. If you ever have any questions and, uh, uh we're excited about uh, what we're going to be able to get done for the 121st district. All right. And congratulations on your, uh, your victory. It was, uh, listen, you're, uh, three times, uh, third time's a charm, right? Third time's a charm. Persistence is the key to success. And if you work for something hard up, hey, I'm a kid from Cornhill section of Utica. I grew it, grew up, uh, pulled myself up by the bootstraps and became a New York State Assemblyman. Wow, good for you. And how in the hell did you get into Brookfield, from Cornhill to Brookfield? <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a long story. <laughs> and from the uh, from, I love it. It's a great town. From the uh, from the the church festivals to wheel days. I mean, that's a that's a big switch right there. Yeah, I guess it is, but it's a great little town, you know, and it's 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 tough. It's a tough environment for these small towns. We have more roads, miles of roads than than any town in Madison County, and probably one of the one of the toughest tax bases to work with. Uh, but you know, we do it. We did it for eleven years, and uh, I wish luck to the to the, uh, to the new supervisor and. Uh, to have his work cut out for him, but I'll always be around to help out my town right. in, the, in the 121st district. All right, Assemblyman John Selka, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll do it again. Thank you. Take uh, care. Coming up, we'll talk to Congressman Anthony Brindisi. Uh, I don't know if you've realized uh, what's happened over the last 24 hours, but uh, he is, it, you know, when Nancy Pelosi said there would be no retribution, there'd be no pushback, uh, you do what you have to do for your district, even if it doesn't mean supporting me, turns out maybe she is uh, punishing some people. And Brindisi is one of them. Wait till you hear what happened in this situation. And not just Brindisi, but the entire New York delegation is being punished because they did not support Nancy Pelosi. At least that's what it looks like. We'll talk to the congressman coming up next to WIBX. did that, uh, that song, and I'll pull that song up. I, I've got to redo it for, uh, for the DA. Um, he's very upset that... Um, I have completely ignored Deansboro and the I've Been Everywhere song. Uh-huh. Uh, but included in there was St. Johnsville. Um, and Chris is on the line right now from St. Johnsville. I was wondering what the tie-in was. Number three here. Good morning, Chris. Hello. Good morning. How are you, sir? How are you, sir? I'm doing well, and I hope you will be after we get done with this very topical question this morning. Are you ready to go? Give it a shot. All right. For uh, $100 in cash from the Hobika Law Firm, here we go. You'll have seven seconds to answer this. In the United States of America, what year did marijuana become illegal? Ready? Go. I'll go with 73. Uh, 1973. Mm. It's probably a... Uh, it was, a, it was illegal that. long before that, yeah. before that. As a matter of fact, it did change in the early 70s. I'll explain that. But it was 1937. Mm. Prior, to 19, oh, wow. th- prior to 1937, um, Cuomo would have had his way. Uh, marijuana was legal in the United States. So uh, do you get out to uh, Utica often? If you do, I'll give you a gift card to the 72 Tavern and Grill, the home of the Utica Comets at the Adirondack Bank Center. All right? Appreciate it. All right, Chris. Davey's going to hook you up. And... Uh, you sit tight. Thanks, man. I thought Thank you were going to ask him if he got to enjoy a, a marijuana joint every every now and then. Do you again. know that, uh, so, United, and the, and this it was a big topic earlier last hour. It became pretty uh, pretty heated over the, the governor's proposal to legalize marijuana. And um, did you know, and part of where all the, what, there was a guy in the, on, by the name of Frank that was talking about how um, the, the laws... Um, the laws against marijuana, the laws making it illegal, uh, a lot of times really go back to the roots of racism. And there is history, and you can read up on it and take it for what it, what it is. But did you know that prior to 1970, if you were caught with marijuana, it was an automatic $20,000 fine. No way. And a mandatory jail sentence. Get and every yeah. state, prior New York to, state, it was, that was federal law. Wow, War United on States drugs. law. Uh, that was prior to 1970. In 1970, the U.S. Congress repealed mandatory penalties for cannabis offenses. So when you hear about people that spent time, and a lot of times it's uh, it's about people that have spent a lot of time in jail or even time in jail, they're now out, but that's on their record, and and uh, that felony is on their record. So have, have, has New York State explained how it will handle this, for instance, anybody who has a conviction? They have. Uh, that You'll see many of those convictions will be uh, completely um, sealed. So there will be no record of those convictions. But, but what if you're in jail right now for something that in two I, months uh, becomes legal? Well, uh, Anthony Brindisi, you were a part of this talk last year. Uh, as an assemblyman, what would happen to people who are in jail? Would there be a release program underway if people are currently in jail for marijuana possession? To be honest, I don't know, because when we were talking about it last year, it was more just put, uh, passing a, a, a bill to study legalization of marijuana in New York State. Yeah, We never really got into uh, any of the criminal procedure aspect of it. 
Uh, all right. Well, listen, uh, on the line right now is Congressman Anthony Brindisi. And I want to talk just a little bit, if we uh, if we could, about, um, you know, there was supposed to be no retribution, but a lot of people believe you've been passed over on a couple of committees because of your opposition to Nancy Pelosi. What's your take? You know, I think it's it's hard for me to say whether it's retribution or not. I, I, I think that uh, New York has a lot of military installations in it. I thought Armed Services was a good committee. There's a number of people that were going for that committee. A lot of those people have... Uh, service-related background, so it was a, a competitive committee to get on. Um, but in any event, uh, I, it's not for me to say whether it was retribution or not. I think it just comes down more to uh, it's, it's you know, there were people who were elected from uh, areas that have military bases of 80,000 personnel. So it comes down to, uh, you know, just the priorities of your district. I've talked a lot about agri- agriculture as being a priority in our district, transportation being a priority. So um, you know, whatever committee I, I land on is going to be used to the best of my yeah, ability yeah. to help our district. Uh, what do you think of they're, they're, they're saying that uh, Re- Representative Kathleen Rice uh, was kind of blackballed in the same way? Uh, I know you're not going down that road, but uh, that, that she was passed up for the House Judiciary Committee. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think Kathleen's a very talented person. She's a former prosecutor. She was a DA. Uh, I think Certainly, she would have been a, a, a valued asset on that committee because she has experience. I'm not sure. There's a lot of lawyers on that committee. I'm not sure how many of them are prosecutors, uh, which I think is something that's important to have. So I, I can't say, speak for what happened in that situation. But what I can say is if, if, if retribution is, is the, uh, the, the method uh, that's going to happen here over the next two years, that's yeah. the quickest way to lose the majority. Yeah. Um, the president of the White House was talking the other day about um, the possibility of reaching out to members who oppose Nancy Pelosi, uh, to those freshman members uh, out there that might be willing to maybe negotiate to get the government back in business and uh, to get the wall built. Have you been, has the president reached out to you? And and what do you think? Uh, uh, and, and maybe have you heard anything that they, he might be? The, uh, I can say that the White House has reached out to me. I have accepted an invitation to go to the White House to talk about the government shutdown, as I think it's my duty to do that. Yeah. When the president reaches out, I think I should go talk, and I don't think talk is a bad thing. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the longest uh, shutdown, Anthony. We're hearing a lot about that. Last week, I kind of felt like the president was, was maybe uh, looking to some sort of a, a, of a resolution by the end of this week. Um, Republicans came to him with a plan to get the uh, the government back up and running with a vow to negotiate with uh, with Democrats to put some sort of a deal together for border security. The president has said to Republicans he has no interest in even talking about that. Um, am I way off base thinking something could be done by this weekend? Well, I, I hope so. This is this can't go on any longer. It's the longest government shutdown we've had. Uh, both sides got to come to the table and compromise. The president is, I would say, dead set on his belief uh, that he wants money for a wall. I think yeah. it's very clear. Um, I've said myself that I think as part of an overall border security package, uh, a, a physical barrier where the experts tell us that would make sense uh, is probably in order. But that can't be the only thing. That we do. There has to be more border patrol. There has to be uh, more technology investments to inspect the trucks and the shipping containers that are coming into our country that uh, don't get inspected. But that's what that's what we have to have happen. And I believe the Democrats should come to the table and put something on the table uh, that they've been wanting. DACA, you name it. I mean, there's yeah, got to yeah, be some kind yeah. of a compromise here to get uh, get this government up and running. You know, sitting at the table and 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 just. Staring at each other, not getting anything done, is not going to not going to solve this problem. We have to actually start putting some concrete uh, ideas on the table as to how we can come together, compromise, and reopen the government. Uh, it is interesting because you've had some Republicans join uh, join with you here in New York um, to reopen the government. It seems like there is a movement out there to do just as you're saying, a, a logical and something that makes sense uh, 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 when it comes to border security, but but doing it from a standpoint where the government is open and operating, you seem to have some support there. 
Yeah, well, we've, we've, we've passed those bills in the House. They're the same bills that passed through the Senate just a few weeks ago uh, that had bipartisan support. The bills that we passed in the House to open the government have had bipartisan support. A number of Republicans uh, from New York joined in, in voting for those bills because everyone believes, uh, I think, no matter where you are on the debate, we've got to get the government up and running. Yeah, you you yeah. can't continue to go down this road. You know, there's, there was a, uh, an article a couple days ago in the New York Times. They profiled uh, a woman who's uh, from our congressional district. She's a, a dairy farmer, and her and her husband own a dairy farm down in Tioga County. They're you know, $350,000 in debt, and they're relying on this USDA federal emergency loan uh, to stay afloat, and now they can't get that. So this, these are just some of the consequences of this of this shutdown. Uh, they're having impact on just not just federal workers. Uh, they're having impact on everybody that, that, yeah. that is uh, doing some kind of business with the federal government. Uh, you've been uh, pretty big on the uh, on the issue of the USDA and the FDA. Uh, part of this, and I, I saw you were at the Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, just a few days ago. But part of your your fear is that um, the safety of food could uh, could be at risk. Sure. I mean, we have uh, an issue that we have to address that there's something like 160 uh, inspections done every week of, uh, you know, food processing facilities or manufacturing facilities that are done by the FDA. Uh, those have stopped. Uh, I know they're going to be adding some more people on to work and, and, get, and catch up with those inspections. But this impacts everybody. You know, the food we eat, uh, we want to make sure it's safe uh, and it's being inspected. Many of these facilities are considered high risk of contamination, and if they go unspec- uninspected, that's going to impact families here back home. So we have to make sure our food is inspected. We have to make yeah, sure that yeah. our TSA workers are being paid so uh, they are showing up to work and making sure that we're not having delays in, at the airport or we're allowing bad people to get through TSA lines to cause trouble. We have to get this government up and running. Uh, I want to ask you a big topic that uh, everybody's talking about here is the issue, and again, you, you have this crossover where, as part of the, the assembly last year, this was a, a big issue, and you know, the legalization of marijuana. It was, it was key in the governor's speech yesterday. Uh, what's your take on it? And uh, we're talking about, I don't know, $300 million in, uh, in tax revenues for New York State. Um, this is one of those issues that has carried over with you from the state to the, to the feds. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I've always said that I think it should be left up to the states to decide whether or not they want to do this. I think if it's done, it has to be tightly regulated, uh, which it sounds like that's the direction New York is going. Uh, so if it's, if it's something that is uh, going to move forward, I can support it. The issue that I'm concerned about at the federal level, uh, as states go into this direction, is that the state doesn't, that the federal government doesn't uh, exact retribution against these states who, who, uh, who decide to, to go this direction. Uh, and I want to make sure that companies who are involved in this aren't going to be penalized and can do things yeah, like yeah. banking and, and deal with financial institutions uh, uh, and, and not pro- prohibited from doing that. Well, it is a problem, the fact that, um, I mean, it creates the opportunity for more crime in places like Colorado where they can't even put their money in the bank. Right. Well, because you're violating federal law. Federal law. The feds. The, the fear is that the feds will come in and, and seize that uh, that money. That's and it's just asking for somebody to come into their place and go into that basement where this money is being stored in in safes. Manasseh. Hey, uh, Assemblyman, uh, I'm sorry, Congressman, back on the uh, the shutdown process. Um, is there an impact here at, at the base in Rome, the federal workers there? Uh, and w- what can you tell us about that? Um, there's, there may be impact on contracts and things like that. There may be on there may be impact uh, depending on whether or not the, the president decides to. Uh, declare a national emergency. There could be impact on funding uh, that has been allocated within the defense budget uh, for places like uh, Rome. So right now, no impact, but uh, the longer this thing hangs out and depending on what course of action the president chooses, there could be more of a potential impact. So the workers there, though, are still working and still being paid to your understanding? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, and DFAS especially because their role is to be well, I guess there are a lot of roles out there that uh, that have essential roles, but they're still and not th- being paid. I think no. we've been hurt. This area has been, I'll say, hurt. I think the workers there have really been hurt by shutdowns in the past, if I'm not mistaken, where people were furloughed. Do you remember that? Am I wrong about that? I'm not, not to get into a whole history thing, but I think in the past we've actually been yeah. hurt by that <clears throat> in this area. 
Yeah, it's it, hard to say. I mean, you have you have people who are FDA inspectors, you have USDA DA inspectors, you have others that are in our area mm-hmm. that are in these roles that are hurt, uh, who are not working. Uh, that's a problem. Or you have I, people that, I, are, that have been furloughed or who have been called back uh, who are working without pay. I've heard from, from folks like that. I was surprised to, to hear that the, the meteorologists with the National Weather Service are, are not being paid. They're working, they're predicting snowstorms, but they're not being paid also. Um, guard as well. Uh, so, Congressman, uh, when Cuomo, I think was last week, he came down to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Who New is York. Who that? Is that Andrew? Yes. That is Andrew. Yes. <laughs> so, Governor Cuomo was down last week meeting with the New York delegation. What were some of the things that, were you present for that? Uh, did he remember you? And uh, was it, what, were, what were some of the things discussed there? I, I assure you he remembers me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, he, he came down, and um, it was mostly, I, I would say, that he did more listening uh, from from us on some of the things that we're working on, uh, things that we would uh, like to see, priorities we can work on together as a state delegation. Uh, he's very concerned about the effects of the tax bill last year that was passed and the limitations on the state and local tax deductions, which uh, negative, negatively impact places like New York. Uh, that's a major concern. So it was a it was a good meeting, um, and we should do more of that. Uh, you had uh, had had uh, helped sponsor a bill that would prevent during a shutdown Congress from getting paid. Seems that that has uh, has been moving along really well. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's 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 unfortunate that you need measures like this yeah. uh, to try and force people to do their job, but uh, it, that's what it's come to. We we should be operating under a budget. We should have a budget that we're operating under. We should be working together to try and find some compromise. Uh, you know, if there's no budget, we should not get paid. That's how it was in in New York. Uh, that's one of the few states that has that that law. If you don't pass yeah, the budget yeah. by a certain date, the legislators don't get paid. The longer this uh, the shutdown goes on. Um, I think the more chance that that legislation could pass um, to prevent something like this from happening down the road. It, it's, it, it's, it's moved in the past. I, yeah. it has, it, it has, it's gotten legs in the past, so yeah, hopefully yeah. it'll get legs again. All right. Uh, very interesting, uh, Congressman. We appreciate the time. Thanks so much. We'll do it again. It. Congressman uh, Anthony you. Berdizzi. All right. Got a break. Hold on tight. Uh, Ryan Nobles from CNN coming up. Decker standing by from Fox News right now. I want to get a, uh, a quick update. On, I know we just talked to Congressman Brindisi just a minute ago, um, who says he has been invited to the White House uh, as one of those freshman uh, Democrats in Congress. Uh, John Decker on the uh, on the shutdown. Where do we go to start off this Wednesday? Uh, good question. Uh, we are on day 26 of the partial government shutdown. Uh, You mentioned uh, a congressman up in your neck of the woods who was invited to uh, the White House yesterday. The president had a luncheon for both uh, in which both Republicans and Democrats were invited. The Republicans showed up. The Democrats did not. And you had the majority leader for the House of Representatives, a Democrat, Steny Hoyer, chastising those Democrats who were invited, who snubbed the president. He said, if you're invited by the president to the White House, you should go. Now, keep in mind, they're not going to and this partial government shutdown on their own. They don't have the authority to negotiate on behalf of the entire Democratic caucus. But I think in terms of optics, it's a good thing not to snub the president. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, and I think that this right now it looks like the president is is owning this uh, this shutdown. But, boy, uh, we all know and we've seen, especially under this current climate, um, they Democrats should be very careful because the tide can turn very, very quickly. Well, it can. So the latest public opinion polls, I believe there was a Washington Post ABC News poll that was released uh, over the weekend on Sunday. It shows that uh, the president and Republicans are being being blamed more for the partial government shutdown. But as you mentioned, things can change. So, you know, it's important. I think uh, Steny Hoyer, the majority leader, recognizes that. That's why he's saying, you know, look, uh, we should do all we can to try to bring an end to this impasse if you're invited to the White House. Go to the White House. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. certainly what Democrats did when they were invited uh, to the White House last week. There are no new negotiations planned uh, thus far, mm-hmm. at least for today or tomorrow, for that matter, uh, with congressional leaders try- to try to end this government shutdown. Uh, Brindisi did tell us this morning that he has accepted a uh, an invitation to the White House. Um, that'll be interesting to see if he gets any pushback from Democrats. Uh... I don't think he will. Yeah. You know, look, I, I think that uh, people... You, you can't bring an end to 
any type of situation in which it's at an impasse unless right. you're talking to one another. And, you know, I think the Democrats recognize that. So, you know, you, you ought to go. Uh, and, you know, your congressman, uh, I think, it recognizes that. And I don't think he'll get any pushback from Democrats for talking. It's yeah. nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with talking. Right. Uh, and uh, the governor, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the president considering a national emergency. Boy, he's really backed off that. He has. This is something that he mentioned early last week. Uh, we thought he was going to go in that direction. He said he was almost certain to do so if uh, he's not making any ground uh, with Democrats. And uh, then he backed off. Uh, he says that it, that would be the easy thing to do. That's why he wants uh, a deal struck yeah. uh, between himself and congressional Democrats. So uh, that em- national emergency declaration, I don't think it's going to happen by the president, although that certainly would be one end one way to end the shutdown. Right, right. And, and, that, and that would ultimately get tied up in court. It would. Um, but it would end yeah. the shutdown because then, yeah. then the president yeah. could say, look, I, I did this. I'll sign those bills that would uh, mm-hmm. open up the government. And then, you know, at, at least uh, on a short term basis, we yeah. have those folks that aren't getting paid paid, which is a good thing. Going to be interesting, uh, John. It we, is. we appreciate <laughs> your time as always. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Have All a great day. Talk you to you real too. soon. Thanks, John Decker from Fox News. Paul Buckley in studio right now. Um, Good morning, William. Has the government shutdown mm. affected you at all? Not at all. Not at all. No. Things are still moving forward. Things are moving on, forward. And, uh, I'm becoming the, <laughs> the uh, Grand Marshal. Uh, everything we're, we're, is... We're moving on. Yeah. But, uh, I, <laughs> You're I, moving. <laughs> so we're not moving forward. We're moving on. Oh, I, just want, I just want to say something about the government. I think that Joe Griffo, should, birthday boy, should get his cake because that's about all he's going to get for the next two years. Yeah, yeah. you're right. That's a good you know, point. He's going to have to eat it, too. You know? <laughs> good mm-hmm. point, Andrew. Good point. Very good point. And I also want to give a shout-out to my lovely bride because you know, everybody knows her as Lucky. And she's, she's Yeah, she's so lucky to have you. Yeah. And speaking mm-hmm. about an addiction, she is my addiction. So. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. That, aren't I sweet? That makes sense. Okay. Uh, like okay, a birthday uh, cake. What is, what, what is uh, anything new in the movie world? Well, yeah. Because got... you don't just show up here. You always have something yeah. to plug. You and Joe Lone. <laughs> <laughs> Only Paul's more upfront about it. Joe yeah. just kind of sneaks Joe, it in Joe's there. a sneak. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very blunt about it. Uh, yeah, we've got... Um, the Ad Man Rush movie is, is they're, they're gearing up now. And they've been okay. around, we've been going around town for the last couple of weeks. And this is the Adrian Brody. No, uh, no, no. They, no. They, they wrapped about a they're week gone. before. Yeah, okay. they're, they're gone. Just can't even keep up. Well, yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah. But, I mean, it, the Ad Man Rush, that's the name of the movie? Yeah. It's okay. A, it's a hockey okay. tournament. So, so it's a hockey movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where you, were, you guys were looking for right. uh, experienced so had, hockey skaters. Right. And we had, we had, the, we had the, uh, the tryouts, the auditions at the Clinton Arena, and over yeah. 300 people showed up. That's awesome. That was very awesome. I didn't know Stefan was such a good skater. I didn't see Stefan. Stefan Rabitsky. I didn't see him there. Uh, I thought he was there. He said he was a good skater? Yeah, I think so. Really? I yeah. don't know how to skate. You think he yeah. would teach me? Well, he, he was such a good skater you. that it was just implied he was going to. He didn't even have to I mean, try out. He was out. so fast we didn't see him. On the, on the ice. No, really, but really it, 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 they went to like 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, just wow. Like, okay. A lot of right. skaters from all over, from like as far north as Watertown, as far wow. down as Binghamton. Okay. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. So they're going to be starting to shoot probably the next couple of weeks, but we, they've been around town looking for locations and stuff like that. And. Everything that everything that the people in the movie, in this movie, and the, and the last movie say about Utica is how lovely it is. And so to, to echo in on what Fred Matt said yesterday about yeah, yeah. The, you know the, the positive things in Utica, it's the people. They they always say how nice they are, how agreeable they are, how eager they are to help out. So I, I just want to say well, thank it's you. Most to, of the people. There's well, always, yeah. well, there the, is the, that small crowd. Well, of, right. They're the problem. Yeah. They're the problem. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that, but that, 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 I don't. Sh- you know, I yeah. haven't run into anybody like that. Yeah, you don't think. No, no, no we don't focus. On I don't. This. I don't deal with people like that. No. Now, Not listen, you. I don't want to derail your conversation, but since you mentioned uh, Fred yesterday and his appearance on the show, we got an email talking about uh, you know Utica nice Club beer and nice how, segue, you, how you go out and you come back in. Well, this talks about a woman whose son. They're from here. Her name is Susan. Uh, she says we brought him Saranac. He he's been working in Africa for two years. Oh, and she says we brought their son. Saren- their son is working in Africa. In Africa, yeah. She okay. said we brought Saranac to him, and uh, he enjoys it uh, in Ghana. So there That's is really Utica cool. Club yeah. in Ghana. Nice. Wow. It's funny, you know. Uh, Fred Matt did say yesterday that you don't realize and you don't appreciate. Uh, until you've been somewhere else, yeah. Try True. living in Africa for a little True. while and, True. and and say, oh, we're in we're impoverished here in Utica. How do they get the beer to Ghana? I mean, how do you get a liquid? Well, That's a, a good, good question, shipping, right? Yeah. Maybe it was in a carry on or uh, in the checked bag. I <laughs> yeah, think there's yeah. different stories. Yeah. Uh, for but, bo- for but, bo- for boxing tickets, Paul, uh, okay. um, give me a synonym for synonym. Synonym for a synonym, uh, alike, simile. No. Metaphor. No. No. Synonym, synonym for synonym. A synonym 
for synonym for the word for synonym. Synonym. <laughs> synonym. <laughs> Try that after Nagel comes in. We wouldn't be able to even do it. Synonym for synonym. Yeah. Any idea? I've, I've, I'm, I'm thinking just uh, think about is that. It nuts? No, yeah. it's not duplicate. It's a movie I'm working on. I was wondering if you could oh. give me some funding and. Um, uh, what, is that city, what it's called? So, synonym right. for synonym. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh well, give me the screenplay. It'll All right, be, I'll work on it. I'll give work me a location. It, yeah. But anyway, they'll be really exciting. They'll be doing a lot of. Uh, this is weird. There's no marijuana actually. in this room. I don't know if anybody. I yeah. smell it though. <laughs> It's because it's probably in your pocket, for God's sake. Yeah. Um, Guilty as charged. Okay. <laughs> Can't wait for legalization, Paul Buckley. Yeah, right. Uh, um, he'll okay. be the pot czar in Utica. I, I will be coming back in for more shameless plugs okay, cool. for, uh, for auditions, for extras, and stuff like that. But I just want to reach out and thank the people of Utica for being so agreeable because these people just love coming here to Utica for these films. And the guy I talked to the director yesterday, He's talking about future projects, so it's, it's, it's starting to snowball. I am going to totally uh, warn you that I'm about to throw a, a question out from left field. Um, did you see that they've, uh, they have now moved the New York State primary to June, which means the mayor is going to have to make an announcement coming up soon. Is it's he true. running, Paul? Answer the question. I, I, don't, I, can't, uh, I can't say that because he, he hasn't said a word to me. I'm yep. not, I'm not, that's not in my pay rate, but... But um, you do know that the fact that now the uh, the primary is being moved to June. Oh, I, um, I, I did know that. I did that, know that. all of a sudden. Well, means the mayor would have to have an opponent. I th- uh, it's opponent. understandable. So, but what I'm saying so, is that means that means that uh, the timeline is completely changed for. Yes, uh, we rushing, just got out in. of all this political well, stuff. Well, you know, and we're going know, right back me, into we, it. Like we need more political commercials and stuff like that. I know. Well, I think we do need more political. Oh, commercials. Well, yeah, true. For as sure. long as you're yeah, using yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, I, it's, it's many a, more. It's a pain in the butt for me to mow my lawn. I got to get off the mower, move the lawn signs. Yeah. Get, you know, that's that why you get a weed whacker. Just I do right around it. Ah, Paul. Tom is on weed whacker, huh? Tom, what are you throwing in there? Tom. Oh. Tom with a question for Paul. Hello, Tom. Yes, uh, Paul, are you going to be at the 1888 Tavern a week from Friday when they announce who's going to be the Grand Marshal? Oh, I, I wasn't. I don't know. I wouldn't go. <clears throat> wouldn't, uh, don't they announce it? They announce I, they they alert the Grand Marshal before that meeting. Oh, right, right. Because they want to make well, sure he's going to be then there. Well, then Paul's surely. answer is, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I may just have yeah, to stop well, by for uh, a beer. Yeah, yeah. also... Are you aware, I don't know if everybody is, the Great American Irish Festival is going back to three days this oh, wow. year. Yeah, so they're, they're going to they're they're have the mass? They're bringing heard, the mass like back Sunday. They are. Yeah. Last week. But was yes, it Tom who are. told us? Yeah. It is. Tom told us, and he's telling Paul now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom, what do you think, uh, let's just be honest, you're tight with the uh, with the Irish community. What do you think, and, and honest, be honest with us. Now, don't embarrass me. What are Paul's chances of becoming... The Grand Marshal of this year's St. <laughs> Patrick's Day Parade. I have no idea because I'm not on that committee, and I don't find out until I get there the day they announce it. I but never it, know it, ahead of time. Well, one year I knew that I was nominated once. Oh. But aside from that, I have no advance information on who the Grand Marshal is going to be. All right, if I were to tell you you got to bet the house on it, what would you bet? Whether they, that he is or he isn't? Uh, I, not, nothing against Paul, but I would say no because okay. there's a lot, I'm with you, a Tom. whole bunch of other qualified people. All right, so you're saying he's unqualified? No, he's qualified, okay. but there's a whole bunch of them. Okay, there's a there's lot like of qualified. One in eight or I'm something not like that. Okay, all right. All right, Tom in Little Falls. Thanks. Tom, of course, has been in several of these movies. That uh, yeah, Oh, my God, he's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Well, not I, much longer. After that, we'll uh, <laughs> bring you back. Can't play hockey. No movie for you. <laughs> time, right, is a, time is a knack of going to these production sets and getting in them. It's oh, I know. I know. He, had, I, he told me about a big city. Big city he has neighbor. an authentic look. He has a an older, authentic look Weather. uh, to him. Weathered. Well, weathered? You're yes. going to call? Oh, yeah. now you're getting back in. Well, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, that was people, nice. you know, he, he had a scene with Adrian Brody. Yeah. And Brody turned to him and said, you know, he's a good actor. So yeah. yeah. That was quite a compliment for Tom. And Tom, I saw him in uh, We the Animals. He's brilliant. Yes, he's very good. Unbelievable. I didn't yeah. think I, I didn't think that was going to come out of him, but I was I was amazed at him. He's very good. He All right, good uh, Commish. Thanks, man. The Commish, no longer the Marshal. No longer the Marshal. Well, well, we don't know. It'll be at the, the halfway to Hooli. You're the Commission. Hopes of being well, a. That's the thing. That's the thing. 
they call it right right halfway that's, to Hooli. Right, well, they used to do that at the Stanley, didn't they? And by the way, at the 1888 Tavern on Friday night, Fred They're Matt will be beer. there. Yes. They're, they're launching this new beer, Polar, which uh, Polar Polar you, a, you haven't tried this yet. Polar Haze or something like that? Polar something? Polar Haze? Polar Haze, I believe. IPA. An IPA, yeah. Which is right in my alley. And then at the Tavern on Friday night, they'll be sampling that. Yes. So maybe I'm planning, before, I'm planning on attending that prior to the Comets you game. You should definitely next before the Comets game. Be next year's spot. halfway to Hooli is going to feature a weed sampling, maybe. Uh, you never know. <laughs> you really don't know. You never know. Are the Mets uh, going to get into that? 825. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Buckley. Thank you, William. And Ryan Nobles from CNN is coming up next to WYBX. Mom in Kentucky was arrested on Sunday for driving drunk with her son in the car. Awesome. She said she did it to teach him a lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, for those that wonder if alcohol your distorts your... father was your, right. <laughs> That's the if, lesson. <laughs> if alcohol distorts your ability to make good decisions, well, then you're probably uh, spot on. She was going 150 miles an hour mm. and was more than twice the legal limit. Smart. All to teach her son a lesson. He's a minor, by the way, so she was also charged... With child endangerment. Kentucky mother told police she drove drunk at high speeds to teach her son a lesson. 48 year old Sunita Jaram was arrested early yesterday and told Lexington police she drank a lot of beer and then drove 150 miles an hour with her son in the car. The son said he tried to get out several times, but the door was locked. Mom's now been charged well, with EWI and child hey. endangerment. Good thing the door was locked at 150 miles an hour. You can only imagine what. What happened to uh, what would have happened to that kid? The, there was no expansion on what the lesson was. Um, don't yeah. drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. I think yeah. that was a lesson. And speed. Don't speed. Sheriff Rob Machel uh, on the line right now. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. I, I know there was a uh, early in the six o'clock hour. The topic of uh, a heated topic, by the way, uh, between uh, a listener named Frank, who's a school teacher in the area, and uh, Manassi got pretty heated over the legalization of marijuana. And there was some criticism of both uh, Pacenti, the county executive, and Sheriff Rob Machel by the caller in terms of being in opposition to the legalization of marijuana. And I believe, Sheriff, you're commenting on uh, on that here. Good morning. Yeah, good, good morning, guys. I didn't hear the call, but I, my phone was blowing up saying there's some caller on, uh, on IBS calling me racist. Well, um, in, in, in fairness, uh, he didn't call you racist. He said that okay. he felt that... The and and there's there are plenty of everybody has a has has a theory on the uh, anti marijuana. I don't want to say everybody, but there are theories on an, uh-huh. on the anti marijuana legislation over the years, and some believe that that came from a place uh, of Jim Crow and uh, and a racist part of America. And by not legalizing marijuana, it further allows the racist laws that are on the books this person says to continue uh which really targets young black men that was the comment not necessarily calling okay. you racist so. well that, that makes me feel better because obviously yep. if, if he did he's, he's way off base um yep. obviously anybody that knows me uh, knows anything about my family knows any about anything about my closest dearest friends um that'd be the farthest thing from the truth that, that i'm racist but sure thank you for clearing that up but um um you know i i totally disagree I mean, in the nine years that I've been the sheriff, we in, and I could go farther back prior to me being the sheriff, we have never incarcerated someone in Oneida County, uh, white or black, for marijuana possession. Um, we don't do that here. I mean, obviously there there's going to be cases where someone was brought in on significant or more serious charges, sure. and that yeah. may have been attached to it. But we don't incarcerate people for marijuana possession. We don't incarcerate people for marijuana use. It doesn't happen. Marijuana sales, a drug dealer, absolutely we do. Um, but but possession and use yep, absolutely yep. nothing further from the truth, um, and and I can actually feel myself getting wound up now. But um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm in the car. I don't have any of my data, but yep. the data is staggering. People are going to die when this happens because um, of of the. I mean, looking at just Colorado alone, 74 percent spike in fatal car accidents attributed to marijuana use by the drivers. We know this is going to happen. That's one of many things. I mean, we're going to tax this stuff 15%. The counties will be able to add another 3% if they choose to sell it here. What is that going to do? The black market, the illegal market is going to skyrocket because my people won't be able to tell if someone bought this legally or illegally. So everyone in, in other states is showing. They're going to go buy the marijuana illegally and not have to pay the tax. Damn, and that could go on and on and on and on. And, you know, at the end of the day, I believe the governor probably has the support to make this happen. 
we're going to try to stop it. But if it goes, it goes. And then the next step, obviously, would be to do everything in my power to see that Oneida County doesn't become one of the dispensary counties in the state. Well, and that's the that's the interesting part. And that was part of the uh, his conversation is um, and and I honestly uh, I, I, you know, Madison County, Oneida County, Herkimer County, Lewis. These are all uh, more uh, more conservative counties. I, yes. I would not be surprised if we find an opt out um, in one or more counties up here. Uh, based uh, and, and by the way, I also won't be surprised if this thing gets legalized within the next uh, four or five months. They're really yep. going to push this through, and there's no oh, sure they Republican. Sure there's they no are. Republican Senate anymore to say no. Yep. And, and and like I said, the one savior that maybe we'll have is you know if we are if we end up being an opt out county, if in fact this passes, then at least we'll have our quality of life issues we can maintain here. Because yeah, yeah. Just look at these other states and the communities where the dispensaries are, the loitering, uh, the, all the all the the other issues that are happening in the communities, the people just walking around like zombies. I mean, it's just I'm just not ready for this. And you know what? I I, I my conscience is clearly telling me that I have to fight this. And if I lose, I lose. And, you know, I mean, obviously my job at the end of the day is to enforce the laws that are on the books, and I totally respect their system, and I will follow it. But, again, in order to to keep my conscience clear, I have to do what I believe is the right thing. And, Sheriff, don't you worry that that this – County by county thing is going to get get very be very difficult and actually make it more difficult for law enforcement. Oh my God, absolutely uh, it yeah. will. Again, because it's it won't make it illegal in the county; just they won't be able to have the first, dispensaries first there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and again, and the other thing is, we we are not prepared. When I say we, this this nation, technology wise, is not prepared to enforce these to detect marijuana use by motor vehicle operators. So it's going to be very challenging for law enforcement. Yeah. It's impossible. And like I said, every single state, and I keep referring to Colorado, they're the ones with the most staggering numbers. People are going to die in car crashes from 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 people who are behind the wheel yeah, under the influence yeah. of marijuana. It's going to happen. Uh, near and dear to your heart, this issue. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Sheriff Mitchell, I appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thanks, guys. Uh, but I, I want to make it very clear. Uh, Frank, who is the caller, and, and he's a local teacher, never once said that you or Tony Pacetti are racist. Uh, gotcha. It feels that anti-marijuana laws are racist just by the pure uh, fact that where they came from in history. Do you know, in 1970, it was a mandatory $20,000 fine, federal law, mandatory $20,000 fine and a jail sentence if you were caught with uh, with marijuana. That was 1970. Wow. It was repealed back then. Wow. Um, and, and again, at the end of the day, this this is still illegal. It's not federally. Federal laws. Yep. So. Uh, we got to dance around that somehow, too. Right. And that, I mean, you have the county but county issue, but then the fact that state versus the feds, uh, they won't yeah. allow the, these people uh, that, that own these dispensaries can't put their money in the bank because the feds will seize the, the money. You it, know how that yeah, goes that only creates the potential for more crime. Uh, Sheriff Mayshall, yes, as always, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. All right. I, I want to take a quick break. We're coming right back with Ryan Nobles from CNN at WIBX. Ryan Nobles from CNN standing by right now. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning. Hey, Bill. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Well, we're shut down, Ryan. They shut down the radio station. Uh, it's all part of the FCC, and, and it's all over for us. And it feels like we haven't gotten paid, even yeah. though yesterday was paid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. My account was full one minute, and then yeah, it's empty on. the next. Psh. Good morning, Ryan. Well, Good morning. You joke about that, Bill, but I, my wife and I uh, were joking about, well, I guess joking is not the right word, but we're talking about this morning that what if CNN just unilaterally decided, hey, we had a rough quarter uh, so um, all the correspondents are just not getting paid this month. Uh, right. You guys still have to come in and work, uh, but uh, yeah, we can't yeah. pay you. I don't I, think there are too many of us would stand for that, but yet no, here, I, there's I, all these federal government workers in this position. Listen, I think this is uh, on all sides. This is just out of control. Nobody seems to be acting responsibly. But the one thing, and, you know, I get it. People write notes to Manansky. This guy's a flaming liberal whack job. No, I just don't I don't agree when someone calls up and says, "Well, they should have planned. They should have saved money. It's their own fault." Imagine if that were to happen to you and your job. And can I add to that? Yeah. Because Trump is allowing, right, or the IRS is still going to issue refunds, and that was really a, a bothersome thing to me. All the people saying, "You should have saved your money. You should Consider that maybe if you're getting a refund, let's delay it by 8 months. 
Right, right, right. even no, that. Well, and then, yeah. w- what, you don't have the money saved? Yeah, you weren't prepared I, I just, for this I, outcome? I, I mean, they didn't ask for this. I don't think we should be using them. And to be honest with you, Ryan, I, I see all sides uh, uh, with fault here. Well, you know, Bill, I, I, with anything in politics, I think there is a, a certain level of blame that can be passed around everywhere. But it, it's hard to ignore the simple fact that President Trump initially agreed to a deal. He sent Vice President Mike Pence to Capitol Hill and told them that if they passed a clean continuing resolution that would keep the government open until February, that he would sign it. And then at the 11th hour, he pulled out and added this wrinkle uh, to the conversation, which has led to a stalemate. Now, have Democrats perhaps not done enough to now come back to the negotiating table? Perhaps that's true. But you cannot ignore the fact right, right. that this that the President Trump initially agreed to a deal and then backed out of it, and that's why we're in the shutdown. And, now, and, and to be fair, Lindsey Graham even coming up with a, a plan to reopen the government and to aggressively negotiate a deal. He brought that to the president this week, and the president said, I'm not going to, I won't back down. Yeah, I mean, the, simply the, the fact of the matter is right now is that President Trump believes that he is only in a position of strength while negotiating with the government shut down. With Democrats now in control of the House, he feels that that's basically his only uh, position of power, and so he's not going to give that away. So his, his thought process is, well, if I just let them reopen the government, then everybody forgets about how important this border security crisis is. But the, the, the thinking uh, in that, there's just not really a logical explanation for it when you consider the amount of money that the federal government is bleeding as a result of this shutdown. People don't realize this, but uh, the government being shut down as, actually costs the government more than it does – when it's open, not to mention the fact the massive economic impact that this is happen, happening having on the country. I mean, you can't pull 700,000 people out of a workforce uh, and expect it to just have a, a blip on the radar in terms of its impact on the economy. In fact, the Trump administration itself came out this week and said that it's double the impact that they thought it was going to have, uh, you know, that people yeah, aren't buying. Yeah. There's a huge uh, p- potential problem that's happening now with uh, the airline industry in that there are these TSA agents that are calling out sick, and there's the chance that people aren't going to book flights because they can't uh, risk the idea of standing in a line for an hour and a half to yeah. get on their on their flight. So this is this there this is more than just a staring contest between leaders in Washington. It's a real world impact, and it's now getting to the point where it could become so bad that we may not be able to recover from some of the damage that this is causing. Hey, Ryan, uh, and here's a fact. Uh, you know, by the way, number one, Mitch McConnell is completely nowhere to be found in, in all of this, which is very interesting because he's uh, he's the one that had to deal with, with the president. But it yep. was, you cannot ignore, and I know Trump lovers are going to say uh, that's not true, you're being biased, and but you cannot ignore that conservative talk show hosts – both on radio and television, are the ones that get into the president's ear and make him flip-flop on on things. And just yesterday, Ann Coulter saying, dead, dead, dead. The president is dead in the water if he does not build the wall. These guys have an effect on on keeping the president firm and strong on this issue. Listen, there, I, I think it is not subjective to say this is a, a pretty objective fact that there is no group of people that have a bigger influence over the president's policy decision than than the conservative media. And, and, and within that, there's even a small handful of really powerful conservative media voices that specifically have his ear. And they have it, uh, it kind of wherever he goes, because he's watching and listening to conservative media. Uh, you know, any moment that he's not working, uh, you know, there's a New York Times story this morning about how he watches it the first when he wakes up in the morning, he has a, a dining room off the Oval Office to watch it in between meetings. And then he's talking to many of them on the phone. You know, he brags about talking to Rush Limbaugh. He talks to Sean Hannity. When he went down to the border, Sean Hannity had special access to the president, um, uh, you know, off to the side, away from the rest of the media. And not to mention the fact that Sean Hannity's former executive producer and one of his best friends, Bill Shine, is Trump's director of communication. So, uh, the influence that he has with them, I don't think, can be under understated. They not only prop him up and tell him what he wants to hear in terms of uh, the view they have of his leadership and the type of president he is, but they also warn him that he won't be that type of leader they claim he is unless he does X, Y, Z. And he responds to that. I mean, I was on Capitol Hill 
when it looked like it was going to be a pretty mundane, let's just pass this continuing resolution. Yeah, yeah. And a couple of reporters said, Rush Limbaugh just said on his show that he called President Trump and told him to hold firm. And then all of a sudden the conversation changed. You know, th- th- there's a very clear line of dots that you can easily connect to show the influence that this, these media leaders have on President Trump. Uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit on uh, on Nancy Pelosi here. And that is that, uh, and although really downplayed by our Congressman Anthony Brindisi, um, it's mm-hmm. being reported that um, Pelosi is kind of punishing certain members who did not support her. In the case of Brindisi, uh, he was blocked from the Armed Services Committee. And and a lot of these uh, these committees, there are other Democrats as well who did not support Pelosi. Brindisi downplayed and said he didn't think so. He thought there might be other people that are from districts that uh, that have more uh, military uh, personnel uh, within the district, et cetera. But what do you think? Is this uh, retribution? I don't think there's any doubt that there's rep- that it's re- retribution. You know, I think that you know, I think Congressman Brindisi was in a difficult spot in his campaign, particularly in the district that he was running, that he had to, to distance himself from Nancy Pelosi uh, to a certain extent, and that there were going to be repercussions for that when he came to Washington. And those repercussions grew when Pelosi ended up winning by such a wide margin. You know, even though they they uh, invested heavily in his district, she didn't necessarily need Ant- Anthony Brindisi to win to become Speaker of the House. And so uh, I think this is always going to be a delicate balancing act for him uh, in his time in Congress, where he's going to have to balance the, the concerns of a, a, a very moderate swing district. I mean, you guys are fortunate, and it's uh, kind of a, a, a negative thing for you as well, that you live in one of the most swing districts in the country, which means you have a variety of opinions, a diversity of thought, which most people that live in congressional districts across the country cannot say. I know the congressional district that I live in Northern Virginia is a rock solid Democrat, and it's never going to be anything else. Yeah. So, but that is the challenge for the young congressman. He's going to have to figure out the best way to navigate that so that he can please his constituents who sent him to Washington in part because they wanted him to be an independent voice, but then at the same time still find a way to be able to get things done. I think there's a there's a path for him to do that, uh, and he seems uh, open to to making that happen. You know, he's not. It's not as if he's throwing grenades at Nancy Pelosi and trying to blow her up, uh, but he's just trying to separate himself as an individual. This may be a minor setback for him in the beginning, but you know there's uh, there's an argument to be made that this could be a long term benefit uh, to show that independence because there was a lot of criticism from many of these Democrats that claim they weren't going to vote for Nancy Pelosi and not yeah, going to yeah. support her that they were going to end up going to Washington and then just, and then just fall in line. Anthony Bernice can now go back to his constituents and say, listen. I'm fighting for you. I'm not fighting for Nancy Pelosi, and this is what happened to me as a result. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to work with her where it helps the district, and when it's not, I'm going to stand up to her, and here's the evidence that I'm doing so. Uh, I want to uh, switch gears, completely switch gears for the last minute or so. And what's your take? I mean, big in New York right now is this issue of uh, legalization of marijuana. It's been a big topic here on the radio. Uh, What are you seeing across the country? Uh, A lot of talk that in, uh, in states where it's been legalized, there is a huge increase in, in automobile fatalities. Mm-hmm. Others say those numbers are being skewed. What are you seeing across the country? Well, you know, what's interesting about the marijuana thing, it's, it's like a ball that's rolling down the hill, and it keeps growing as it goes down the hill. And people see other states legalized, and they want to jump on board. They see an economic advantage to it. But I had a conversation a while back with uh, somebody that was a pretty top-level aide to John Hickenlooper, who, uh, Looper, who's the governor of Colorado, and he was a, a part of – their legalization of marijuana. And I was in Colorado not too long ago, and, you know, you see people smoking pot everywhere, and everybody seems to be happy about it. It seems to be a, a thing that they all are in favor of. And I said to Michael, it seems like this has been a pretty big success. You know, there's been a huge yeah. uh, in, injection of, of, of tax dollars as a result of it. But this was somebody that worked on, on the, the program, and he told to me, you cannot view the success or failure of marijuana legalization in the first 10 years, maybe not in the first 20 years. He said the long-term repercussions won't set in for some time, and it, it's going to require a, you know, a huge amount of work on the benefit of law enforcement. It's going to require a huge education program, and it's also going to require laws constantly adapting and changing uh, to the new challenges that legalizing something like this uh, presents. You know, yeah. even though, you know, Marijuana is rampant everywhere you go. I mean, you're, you'd be naive to think it isn't. It opens it up to a whole new group of people that wouldn't even touch it if it were 
illegal versus if it were legal. And there are consequences to that. So mm-hmm. I, I heard your interview with Sheriff Mayfield. He's somebody that's on the front lines of that and understands yeah, yeah. it as well. So you were naive to think that you just legalize this and uh, it'll just be all kumbaya and everybody will enjoy it and there'll be no problems. Uh, it's going to require a lot of effort on behalf of governments across the country to manage it in an appropriate way. You know, it's no different, I think, in many ways to the proliferation of casino gambling, mm-hmm. uh, which you guys know very well. I mean, uh, the uh, central New York was among the first uh, places in the country to really uh, expand uh, access to uh, casino gambling. That's fun. People like it. If you do it in moderation, it's a good thing. But to, uh, the idea that there are no consequences associated with yeah, it yeah. Uh, is naive. And I, and I think that those two things fall on that same line. And I don't think we'll know for sure if it was a good idea for maybe 50 years. Uh, it is interesting to think about the people that would not smoke or partake, whether it's edibles or, or smoking, if it, unless it, it became legal. And the legalization opens that, that door uh, for them. And then uh, down the road, when you're brought up with it, um, uh, how they, what, what the effects will be. But at the same time, Ryan, uh, we have a catch-22 because prohibition just doesn't work. And uh, no, we've doesn't. certainly and, uh, yeah, learned and, that. And, you know, I think the argument that pro-cannabis people would tell you is that the, it, it's much better for the government to be in control of the regulation yeah, 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 of it yeah. and the distribution of it than the black market because that allows – the government to kind of to study it and understand what works and what doesn't work, where you put dispensaries, where you don't Got put it. dispensaries. Yep. You know, all that stuff. So, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Ryan, we'll do it again next week. Thanks. Enjoy your week. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Uh, from CNN, it is uh, Ryan Nobles. All right. Another pair of uh, uh, boxing tickets to give away to the Turning Stone. 361 show for tickets if you'd like. We'll do that again tomorrow on WIBX.